Music scene investigation once again on the air, everyone, as the intro starts up again. But that's all right. I'll just cut it off. It's all good from here. Glad to have you along with us today. It is the week after the Super Bowl. Did you see the Super Bowl? It was a travesty. I've got to tell you that. I was really amazed at how poorly the Broncos played. But it is what it is, I guess. I said Seattle would win. You did, you did, and you were right after I said it, of course. So it's all good from there. And, I remain and, moot on the subject. And and that's fine, Tom. You can be moot or mute or any other oot that you would like. So <laughs> uh, on today's broadcast, uh, we're going to take and review three new songs as submitted by artists from around the world. And we're glad you're joining us for that. And it's going to be a great show because we have a treat for you a little later on in the show as well. Something that is a bit of a secret in that no one has ever heard it before. And no, it's not Tommy saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm get that straight out there up front so everybody knows. It is a secret and we'll reveal that when we reveal our guest panelists. So hang in there for that. First of all, we're going to go over to Mr. Tommy Chianti in New York City, find out how he's doing. Hey, Tommy, how are you, sir? Good afternoon and good evening, people. I am doing quite well, thank you. Um, preparing for a, a big but short blast of winter weather again. But all is well in the studio. I got my backup computer that I'm anxiously waiting to hook up and then i can compete with rich as far as setting up all my computers i'll have i think four or five at that point including the infamous g4 mac os 9 for those geeks among us <laughs> now you said you were getting more snow i've got the question uh, everybody wants answered how much snow did you already have and how much are you planning on getting a uh, few inches, we still have leftover tusks, as if I may call them that, of uh, about six to eight inches in, in certain areas. But it's winter as I remember it growing up. Oh, that's Whereas, good. Well, you know, back in the Stone Age, winters were winters. You know, I, I remember a winter when a neighbor had his house, uh, the, the snow was so bad, it drifted and snowed them in. They had to dig out of their house. I used to have, I live in a basement apartment years ago, <laughs> and we had one snow, and I opened my door and was greeted by an avalanche. And I had to call my, uh, with my friend I was renting from. I said, could you please come and dig me out? <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, three hours later, I hear a knock on the door, and uh, the, <laughs> it was a little porthole <laughs> that he had just made it for emergency purposes and says, you know, uh, we'll be with you in a moment. <laughs> and I said, thanks. You know? Just just put food and drink through that hole and we'll be fine. And stick a straw, you know. Well, I hope, I, I hope the weather treats you well up there, Tommy, and I hope it's not too too much snow. Thank you, thank you. It will be all that we can take, as usual. Well, good thing is winter's almost over. True. All right, well, thank you for being here, Tommy, as always. And over across the pond, we have Ian and our guest panelist in the same place, which doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, you know it's special. Ian, how are you today, sir? And, and I see that you have Mr. John Schroeder with you today. I'm here with Mr. John Schroeder and... Behind the screen, Di as well. So um, there's three of us sitting here to do the show today. Say hello, Di. Hello. There you go, you see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really pleased to be back here again. And uh, Diane happens to be my fiance, And uh, we got engaged about a year ago. Mm. This is the last time I saw Ian. And uh, so I'm really, really pleased to be back here again. Well, uh, Wait, you got engaged to Ian? Yeah, and I was engaged to Ian. Yeah. Well, look, there's a ring. <laughs> <laughs> well congratulations to you john and you uh as as i was telling her earlier she has been lucky enough to get hooked to and grab on to a very talented man so oh well i'm truly honored by that statement <laughs> i just do my job like you everybody does uh, and i uh, just want to make 
good music and make people happy. Yeah. Well, we're happy to have you back with us now. Uh, you said it's been almost a year, about a year since you've seen Ian. So that means uh -huh. it's been at least that long since you've been on the broadcast with us. So Absolutely way true. Too long. Yeah. yeah, it is way yeah. too long. I agree with Tommy. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been up to in the preceding year? How have things been going for you? I'm sure you've been busy in studio and things like that. Well, I have been busy in the studio primarily with one particular artist, namely Samandi. Um, uh, this band, I found them in 1971, 72, and uh, we recorded uh, three albums. Uh, we had, uh, at that time, a top 20 hit in America, uh, a top 50 album. Uh, the band had been to America. We played the Apollo uh, Theatre in Harlem and all that stuff. Uh, they were with Al Green and... Anyway, that's going back years, some years ago, but now we're really happy to have um, produced their fourth album. It's taken two years to make, so that's what, I, what I've been involved with. And uh, I can enlighten you some more as we go on about the new album. Well, I definitely am interested to hear more about it. I, I especially want to hear how much of a uh, uh, pain in the backside Sam has w was to work with during the creation of that album. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a bit unfair. Where did that come from? He's, well, just, he's just digging for dirt, basically. I am. I'm that's digging for... Doing. Exactly. So the next time Sam Kelly comes on with us, I have something to uh, to, to, to to say about him. You know, he's a very <laughs> mysterious guy. I cannot oh. think of two more gentler gentlemen than Sam and John. They must get along great. And the creative yeah. juices must spark. Sam, Sam is a... Is a, is a great drummer, has become a great drummer, starting with the band in 1970 and playing some Andy music. But the guy has really worked really hard and become a very much in demand session musician. And he's playing on all sorts of gigs and going around all the world playing. And he's very hard to get hold of. And to get yes. him onto the new Samandi album and get involved with the new product was actually pretty difficult to do. So, so in other words, John, I guess uh, we'll have to wait to get the dirt on Sam until after we're off the air. Well, you will really, yes. <laughs> yes, I think you will, yes. Somehow I feel like just uh, getting hold of him was the biggest pain. Yeah, he is hard to get a hold of. That is very true. And uh, we're just glad to have you here with us, John. And uh, congratulations again on uh, the upcoming nuptials. Well, thank you very much. Well, there's been no decision on that, but uh, we made the first step. <laughs> hey, that's half the battle right there. Yeah. So let's let's talk a bit about the album, John. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's, yeah, let's sure. tell everyone a bit about what we've got. Crazy game, guys. Well, there you go. This is a promo version. Yeah. Not quite the finished product. It's a great this... album cover choice as well. Yeah, that's the sampler package. It contains four tracks. The overall title of the album is Crazy Game. And if you listen to the lyric of that song and understand what the world we're living is, it's just a crazy game. Um, uh, the great thing about Samandi, they're very, very capable of writing very infectious material, uh, very rhythmic material. They've had a sustained fan club for many, many, many years, and it's still in existence. And there is a demand for a fourth album. I mean, that's not bad, you know, four albums. Um, but this album, Samandi 2014, had to be a bit different from the others. It had to be a development from the previous three albums. I would add here uh, that the previous three albums, namely uh, Samandi, Second Time Round and Promise Heights, have just been released digitally for the first time. And uh, so they should be reaching uh, the world ears, if you like, almost right now. But they're paving the way for this new album, which hopefully will see the light of day internationally within the next two or three months. And the, these are available on iTunes, Amazon, yeah, all and all stuff. of the big, yeah. re, big yeah. digital retailers. Yeah. And um, the band are being put together again. They're getting the band together again. We've been asked to do the Jules Holland show, which is a t major TV show here. And down the road, Glastonbury, the Glastonbury Festival, which would be a tremendous exposure for them. 
That'd be fantastic. But for me, this album was really, really exciting. It was a challenge because having not been in the studio and recorded anything for 30 years, and to select the material, unfortunately, there are very prolific writers. I selected all the material, arranged it, put it all together. And, um, well, I think, it's, I think it's a strong album. I, I, think, I think Samandi are always a, an incredibly original band, very identifiable, mm, very definitely. melodic, um, and very much today. And a lot of people might not know the name, but there's a good chance they've heard the music in well, films, films and Well, I think that this album, more than any of the other albums, Ian, will open a new market for them because totally. the material has got a much wider audience. It's uh, more commercial, if you like. Yeah. I mean, having, having heard what I've heard and knowing some of the back catalogue as well. Yeah. It, they, It'd be interesting to know what Tommy thinks of it, you know, from a, from a technical point of view. But... Uh, we went out to record this with an analog approach initially because Samandi Ara have got a live feel about them, and we want to retain that infectious live feel of rhythmically about it. And so we, the original engineer, has been involved with it, and uh, we set up the studio in an analog fashion, and really didn't get involved with Pro Tools until we came to the mixing. Uh, so we've got hopefully the best of both worlds. Uh, Today and yesterday, mm. if you like. It does sound that way. You, it's definitely got an analogue feel, but it's got a much more contemporary mix to it. Well, thank you very much. Well, that's so, from my opinion, anyway. From what no, I, I don't know. So. I'm too close to it Yeah. to know, but to me, I'm very inwardly very happy with it. <coughs> I'll tell you what, Darren, we've did got... you do any in-studio in video, in videos to add to the live feel to it? No, it would have been... It just wasn't possible to do that. Uh, it was thought of, but... but um, if you know what it was to record it, <coughs> excuse me, and the studios we recorded it in, uh, it was very difficult to do that. So uh, we've now got to put all the marketing and the promotion together and uh, after the event, if you like. Yeah. Let's have a, let's have a listen to Crazy Game. We've got a clip. Uh, We're going to play about 30 seconds odd, I think. Is well, that I haven't Rich? heard it for ages. But, uh, um, you haven't heard it for ages? No. <laughs> so you're looking forward to this listen as Absolutely, well? Absolutely, yeah. But this, guys, is an exclusive. This has not been played anywhere else. So sure. we are emphasised the first to carry a sample of Crazy Game by Sir Mandy. So uh, give it a proper introduction, John. Well, let me introduce uh, Sir, Mandy's from Fangio's, Sir Mandy's forthcoming album, title track and name of the album, Crazy Game. Let's find out what the guys think about what they've just heard. And uh, let's go back over to John and Ian. And uh, it, it sounds great to me, guys. We only got the last five seconds. <laughs> you only heard the last five seconds. I played. Yeah. I, well, you should have listened to more of it because I played like 40 seconds of it. You didn't I, got to type hear to least, I got to hear at least 15, 20 seconds of it. It does have a nice ambient uh, live feel to what I heard. I, I, it's very well recorded and, and it was played excellently. So I'm... Oh, don't just be nice, Tommy. Say what you really feel. It won't, won't upset me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I mean, for a critical listen, that's far too short a time. Uh, yeah, I know, I'm only checking. But it well, is that. I love the feel. You caught that instantly, you know? So that, that, that's uh, a plus right there. Oh, well, good. Well, that was, uh, that was an achievement. That's what we were trying to achieve. So uh, when you get so close to these things, as you know, you really don't know. And by the end of it, you, you get confused yourself and say, 
what have I done? You know, I think my first marriage, one of the things that stood out to me on that, uh, and, and by no means I'm, I'm not a panelist on the show in any way, shape or form. It had a very wide feel to it. I mean, it felt like I've heard, uh, the previous Samandi track that we've had on, uh, MSI and this one, the difference between the two is this sounded more spread out as Tommy likes to say a lot. Yeah. Uh, there was more room in the mix than uh, the previous uh, track I've heard from Samandi. That's absolutely right. Yeah, that was that was the initial idea. Uh, I think the when combination you... of um, analog and digital uh, it did work. John, um, there's a phrase called "in the box" when you use like a door, like Pro Tools or whatever. Um, was it all done in the computer, or was it run through like an analog board or any out? Board gear processing, all, all done computer wise. Yes, it, it was. It was done that way. And uh, I mean, we set the studio up in an analog fashion and recorded it. Um, I don't think it wasn't recorded onto tape, um, but we got the analog feel from live feel from the studio and uh, did the whole tracks like that. And, and then finally got to the digital stage, not until the mixing. Okay. Thank you very much. And we're getting some of the guys and gals out in the chat room giving some feedback to you. Uh, said it's very nice. Uh, one of the guys, the musician out there, goes, yeah. And uh, they said they heard about 40 seconds or so of it. So they appear to like it very well, John. It's, I know why we only heard five seconds, because you forgot to press the wrong button. It's great. I, I mean, Samandi uh, wanted to, if I could interject, are not unknown over there, because, uh, uh, you know, all the three albums have been released over there in, during the 70s. They've got uh, a fan base, they've got a website, and, uh, you know, they're fairly well known in America. In fact, they're really more well known over there than they are over here. Yeah, in fact, I was talking with uh, one of our previous guest panelists at one point, uh, Susie Chase in New York City. She has a uh, a broadcast she does, which is the number one podcast of soul music uh, in the U.S. And yeah. she's heard of Samandi and uh, yeah. has enjoyed their music very well. Well, the big track at the time was The Message, which made the top 20. Uh, and the album called Samandi followed it, uh, made made the top <laughs> Top Billboard 100, I think, at the time. Well, we appreciate your definitely. Uh, we appreciate your uh, sharing uh, the title track "Crazy Game" with us, even though we played just a bit of it for everyone. Uh, we appreciate you doing that. Pleasure, absolutely pleasure. Yeah. Exclusive, guys and girls, from yeah. Mr. John Schroeder himself. There you have it. There you have it. <laughs> now yes, with the gift. Exactly. Well, there's We've got a long way to go. We've got a lot of work to do on it, but it's all beginning now and it's all happening right this minute. And I'm very pleased that you guys should be the first to be in on it. And I can only hope and pray that it uh, does what we all hope it's going to do. No, based, based on what I heard, I think, uh, I think you've done a great job. I think it needs more cowbell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're probably right. The tambourine might be a bit loud as well. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, let's let's take an opportunity and listen to some more new music and find out if any of them need more cowbell as well. So, uh, gentlemen, I guess the uh, proper thing to do is uh, start out with song number one on today's broadcast and get your take on it in just a couple of minutes. So here it is, everyone. <coughs> song number one on today's music scene investigation. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you. 
That's track number one on today's music scene investigation. Before we go to the panel, I uh, do want to let John know uh, that uh, Pinky out in the chat room said the horn sounded nice and the voice was stellar on the Samandi track. So uh, there you go. Let's go over to Ian and John and get their take first. Ian, I'm going to start with you. What do you think of the first track on today's show? All right, without sounding rude, I'm glad they kept this short. It's about two minutes long, which for a song with no real melody or no real changes to it is a good thing. You know, this is the sort of piece of music that could be used on a computer game or a film or TV or something like that, you know, corporate corporate work. You know, as it stands, it, the mix is, is passable. Drums sound quite nice. Did feel the xylophone that was playing the kind of melody that was there it was a tad too bright and a tad too loud, and it just stuck out above the rest of the track. It didn't sit and blend with the rest of the track. But I mean, as a composition, there was some nice sounds going on. There was a nice sonic palette being used, but there just wasn't enough changes going on. It just stuck on that level. You know, there was no real dynamic to it. It didn't move anywhere, and the, the melody was just—it was all over the place. There was no sort of hook. Even a track without vocals and without lyrics, it can still have a, a hook, a melody line that sticks in your head. Um, and this lacked that for me. As I said, you know, really nice to see that someone's obviously gone, right, I'm going to do instrumental rather than blow it out of the water and give everyone a six minute and bore them to death. I'm going to keep it short, keep it nice. I think, you know, there's a structure here, there's a, a half decent mix here, but from an arrangement point of view and a composition point of view, it needs some attention. All right, makes sense. And since we're with you guys over in England, how about you, John? What do you think? Uh, I would uh, sum it up with one word, overall being pleasant. Pleasantly listenable. listenable. Uh, I like the opening when the first few bars and I was just waiting for something to happen. Mm. In fact, I was even waiting for the voice to come in and waiting for the actual melody to establish itself, but it didn't. It went into a sort of... Um, quiet groove. I like the rhythmic feel. The rhythmic feel was nice. Uh, touches of sort of arresting sounds in there and so on. But as Ian rightly see, said, I see it to, to find a TV series, yeah. a serial or a, um, a radio show or something. It's background music. Basically, it's background music. Very listenable. Uh, very pleasant. Um, you know, in a film, TV show or something like that. But... Um, I suppose one could take that track and add something more substantial to it. Uh, maybe add a strong melodic line, even introduce a voice in it, and uh, create something a bit more original about it. But it was very present, very listenable. That's about, about it for me. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Over to Mr. Tom Chianti in New York City. Tom, tell me what you think. Yes, sir. Well, it was pleasant. Uh, but to me, it sounded like a very long intro. Um, I agree with Ian and John. You know, um, <laughs> the roads or was uh, distorting a little bit in the left channel, and there, you know, it was all um, the word. It was all like waiting for something to build and didn't. All tension, no release, so to speak. Um, the sounds were interesting. The mix was passable, as, as Ian said. And I could see it, you know, for commercials or uh, industry type of short uh, filmography going on. It, it was very pleasant. And I, I just, like I said, it seemed like a, a very interesting intro, if over long, to uh, a much better of uh, something to come along. I, w I would have loved to have heard uh, a female scatting of um, almost Celtic or operatic vocal with a lot of nice, uh, roomy, airy reverb or something over it to to add another dimension to it. It was, it was pleasant. Uh, there's definitely a start 
And I, I just think that the, the person has a feel for production and, and structure and should develop it more. All right, Tommy, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. The name of track number one on today's broadcast is Porn Music. I know, kind of bizarre, but that's what it's called. It's by PC Ben. We appreciate Ben sending that track into Music Scene Investigation. Thank you very much, Ben. And Ian, you're muted for some reason. Random. Not enough wah-wah guitar there, Rich, for, for porn music. No, I, I would agree with that, <coughs> but that's what Ben has called it, porn music. So No cowbell <laughs> either. <laughs> no cowbell yeah. either. Or German accents. Or a video to go with it. That's a, well, we can't show that on here, John. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. you know. <laughs> we'd, get, we'd get in trouble for doing that, unfortunately. I'm down, John. It's not your bachelor party yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, All right, let's go into song number two on today's broadcast. Here it is, everybody. Enjoy track number two.
And there you have a song number two on today's music scene investigation. We're going to go over to Tommy, start with him first this time. Tommy, what do you think of track number two? Well, rhythmically, I really liked it. I like the, the mix of electronic and, and, and um, electric. Um, it is a strong song here. I liked all the elements. I just think the mix really needs some work. Um, I like the introduction of the female vocal. I would have loved to hear her take a lead part. Um, the sustaining chords were a little too prominent, and but it, overall feel wise, it, you know, the, the the I think they're programmed drums, and I'm not a fan of a bucket snare, but that snare was killing me. Um, the the hi hat and the high end percussion was really tasteful done. It, it's it's a really really strong start, a strong song. I think um, maybe. You know, giving the female vocal, I mean, both of them had great voices, giving the female vocal a trade-off part, uh, more background vocal, definitely, even though the ones that were there I liked. Uh, again, my biggest problem besides the snare was the vocals could have come up a little bit, as I always say. Um, the mix is, is not coherent. But it, it is a good production. It's a strong production and a very strong um, feel and groove to it. Where you, you know, usually if something's in your face and sustaining for too long, it gets annoying. But this was done very well. It's very well produced. I just think more attention to the mix. Maybe, um, like I said, uh, more female background vocals or giving her a little bit more. Uh, in of a wee trade off in the whole thing. Um, overall, I like this song a lot. All right, fair enough, Tommy. Thank you very much. Over to Mr. John Schroeder and Ian Husbands. John, what do you think about track number two? Yeah, I think overall it's very interesting, but I found it rather confusing, quite frankly. I think that the blend of uh, the vocals and the background didn't <clears throat> didn't fit together. Uh, properly, and yet they could have done if more attention, I agree with Tommy, with the mixing, uh, concentrating on sorting out the vocals, um, um, you know, more carefully and getting more out of the voices. At one point, the voices sounded extremely confusing to me, and and it got out of sync almost with the rhythmic feel of the song somewhere about halfway through it. Um, there's a lot of things going on in there that has got a lot of potential, but it ends up with it not being coordinated and i think you've got to take it apart from the beginning and re-put it together um basically there's a good song there rhythmically uh <clears throat> the rhythm stands up and the, the vocals are there but overall it needs to be remixed and the individual parts resorted out so they fit together a little bit more yeah. better that's yeah. that's how it sounds to me all right and ian what do you think is it me or is all this sort of music, is everyone just starting to sound like killers these days? Yeah. Uh, we, we hear a lot of this type of rock, sort of indie rock pop stuff coming through the hallowed halls of MSI these days. And it's all starting to sound like the killers. You know, the killers' first album was great. The rest of the stuff was basically rip-offs of um, Bruce Springsteen. But, you know, it's, uh, yeah, uh, the originality, please, guys. I, I'd like to hear something different. You know, as soon as you hear that, that rhythm guitar sound, you know that's what you're going to get. That rhythm guitar, coincidentally, I felt was too loud in the mix, dominated the track a lot of the time, which is where I think the, the vocal problems are coming in. Because, as, as Tom said, there was some really nice uh, production going on there from the point of view of, you know, the drum sounds, that, that ride cymbal and stuff that was being played. It all sounded really, really crisp and very, very nice. Um, you know, all the sounds were there, but it was just all on top of each other. Again, to me, it just sounds like this is another battle in the wall of noise uh, industry that we seem to be competing against. It's, uh, everything's compressed, everything's pushed together, nothing's got any space. You know, there were some really nice things going on. It was like a xylophone or a marimba or something like that going on. And uh, I swear I heard a cello at one point in time or some strings coming in. But oh, it was the horn. All yeah, it was all just a mesh 
of sound. Nothing was separated. Nothing had its own space. Um, you couldn't, you know, it was, as John said, it was getting confusing. Your ears couldn't make sense of what was going on. It sounds a bit dated, doesn't it? Uh, I think the killers do. There's an 80s sort of feel yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. But, yeah, again, nice addition of the female vocal. The guy can certainly sing, liked his voice. Uh, the drummer, whoever was playing, oh, there's some lovely, lovely stuff going on there, some off beats and some stops and some pushes. And, um, you know, really felt that he was giving it his all and playing fantastically. So, you know, 10 out of 10 for the drumming, if nothing else. But uh, where's the bass? Again, the bass just seemed to be a mesh of bottom end. There was no clarity to it. Um, Song-wise, you know, there is a song here, but it does sound like another Killers song. And it does need uh, a stronger hook again. You know, I, I just didn't feel that hook coming in on that chorus. The, the sort of transition between the verse and the chorus was great, but it just didn't hook me enough. I need to hear more of that. All right. Well, I appreciate your thoughts, gentlemen. And the name of that track is called, or that track is called, Happy Song. And that's by a group called Spoons and Chopsticks. And we appreciate their sending that track in to Music Scene Investigation. If you'd like your song in front of the panel, it's very easy to do. All you have to do is go to musicsceneinvestigation.com. And at the top of the page, you'll see a submit a song <coughs> link. From there, you can get your song in front of our panel. Every what? Sunday, we'll select three new ones, all randomly selected. You never know what you're going to get or what you're going to hear. And uh, we'll put it in front of our panel and find out what they think. Gentlemen, we have one more track to go to today. Red? One more. Yes, sir, Tommy. One thing I'm very surprised that Ian didn't comment on was that is one of the longest automated fade outs that to the point it bothered me. And I don't mind fade outs, but I'm surprised he didn't bring that up. That's a good point. Anything to say about uh, that, Ian? Again, it's just you could be I'm becoming to expect it from this sort of track. Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I'm getting to a point where it's like, oh, another fade out. I'm not even gonna mention it. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fade but, outs and you're all. You're so 2011, darling. That was my <laughs> bitch of 2011. You're going to have to come up with a new one. It's 2014, you know. <laughs> all right. Here is song number three on today's music scene investigation. I hope everybody enjoys it. Here it comes.
That is song number three on today's music scene investigation. And we're going to go back over across the pond and talk with John and Ian. John, what do you think about track number three after hearing it? I think that's a, a very a pleasant album track to me. Um, I wouldn't know who the artist was or something, but it sounds like a sort of a putting into a slot, an album track. What I do like about it is I think that the voices, the melodic line works very well with the rhythmic uh, background, if you like. I think there's been a lot of thought about the arrangement of it. Uh, it's unobtrusive, uh, you know, it takes you along with it. It's pleasant melodically. It's again that word pleasant, it's not dynamic in any way, but it works together. It's a nice combination of things going on in there, and uh, <clears throat> that's about, about it for me, really. It's, uh, I like it. Overall, I like it. All right, I appreciate that, John. And over to Ian. Ian? What do you take on track number three? Yeah, it is inoffensive. It's pleasant to listen to, but it's also very safe. Um, you know, it's got that sort of, yeah. to me, 70s Woodstock singer-songwriter mm. vibe about yeah, it. You know, yeah. bands like The Birds and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you, do you reckon? Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, really nice use of harmonies, really nice arrangement of harmonies, uh, the pick-up with the backing vocals and the second chorus. But, you know, it was textbook through and through from the point of view of chord structure, arrangement. You know, I could have bet you $10 that that big electric distorted guitar was going to come in somewhere towards the end after the middle eight, and it did. Um, I think, you know, yes, it's a pleasant song. It's easy going. There's a, a, a strongish chorus there, nice transition again between the, the verse to the chorus into the middle eight, you know, all distinctive parts. But as John said, Really did lack dynamic. I mean, that guitar at the end did bring a bit more into it, but there was no real peaks or troughs, you know, from the point of performances. Performances were all pretty good. Didn't like the layering of the the lead vocal, the double layering. It sounded like they sort of tracked themselves a couple of times and was singing that as a doing that as a lead vocal. Didn't like that, and I, and I did feel that from the point of view of the mix, it lacked shine. You know, those acoustics sounded very dull. Um, it might have even been mixed by the drummer because the drums were up there and they were as clear as a bell. Whereas, again, the bass just seemed to sort of be flapping around the bottom ends. Uh, the vocals weren't quite sat on top of everything. They were sat too much in it. <clears throat> you know, even the, even the harmonies, I think, you know, drop them drums back, give everything else there a chance and, and make it shine a little bit, give it a bit of top end um, because it just seemed to be sitting around the bottom end and the mids. Which is a shame because, you know, as I said, there is a good track here. And again, if back go back to Woodstock, this would probably be played on the main stage. But I don't know, is there a market for it now? Not too sure. All right, Ian, I appreciate that. Thank you. And over to Mr. Tom <coughs> Chianti. Tommy, what do you think about track number three? Well, I, I agree with both Ian and, and John, especially John, about it being album track. Um what bothered me, besides the lead vocal being buried on and off and the paper-thin snare, was that the acoustic on the left side was just drowning everything out. I think it was mixed by the acoustic guitarist. I mean, that is a primary source for lack of dynamics. The production is good. I really like the layering of the background vocals. Mm. Uh, again... The most important thing in a song that has vocals are the vocals. Uh, they really need, especially this guy's voice was a little on the thin side and could have definitely used more presence, more bottom end. Um, lyrically, yeah, it was safe, and there's nothing wrong with safe. Um, again, this could find its way into film or, or commercial or something, a uh, country western feel. Uh, the mix isn't as uh, uh, darkish, to say the least, as Ian pointed out. Um, there was uh, little timing issues throughout, especially at the end, going into that change and the final hit. I mean, in the yes. digital age, you could have moved the hits at the end, you know, lined them all up. Yeah, that was uh, that Tom feel that was really sloppy, yeah? 
Yeah, yeah. There was yeah, that yeah, yeah. At the that. end there around four minutes or so that it, it sounded like an extra two bars were, were thrown in. And it, the turnaround, it just didn't work. Um, and he missed the symbol going in as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe there. The mix is just not cohesive. Um, you know, I, I hate to be so technical on a show where we go by song. I mean, again, it's a, it's a good song. It's a safe song. Something to listen to as you're driving down the road. It, it, it's unobtrusive. The vocals, when you can hear them, are pleasant. There's a lot of thought gone into the production. It just wasn't, um, the mix was not produced. A lot of people who mix don't realize they also have a responsibility to produce the mix because you can change subtly. Uh, dynamics, bring them in where they weren't before or enhance what is there just by automation and um, just, you know, take the song apart, eight bars by eight bars, then listen to the whole thing, but primarily always the vocals are the source you've got a message there whether it's a safe message whether it's, you know, out there whatever, it must be heard and the vocalists, no matter how nice their voice is, if they aren't given the attention they need, it's not going to matter. And a lot of impact of the song will be lost. And um, I, I like the song and production in general. The mix is a, is a no-go for me. And I, I really, you know, you don't really know, you know, whether this is in some guy's bedroom or whether they had studio time and not enough time. It's a two-hour mix when it should be an eight-hour mix. You never really know the full, especially on this show, since everything's, you know, by chance. You never know what we're going to get. So, you know, I take all of this into account when, when I get into the technical end of it. But it's just downright basic rule of thumb. Vocals have to be heard, have to be out there on top of the mix or set in the mix, but punching through. And, and, and especially since this had some very nice chorus layering and the guy's voice were nice, it really is a shame that I, I didn't get to hear the attention that they needed. All right, Tommy, thank you very much. Now, the name of this track is nothing is going to slow us down and it's by a group called we don't mind the chaos and we appreciate their that's a mouthful i had to use a smaller font on the screen and everything but it is <laughs> and, you know i have to make sure all these things fit on the screen and uh it was quite a uh uh trial and error kind of thing so Sometimes gentlemen, OCD is a good thing, right, Rich? I, I guess it is, Tommy. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I want to make sure everybody can read it and all that good stuff. All right, gentlemen, you have the task at hand now of deciding on a song of the week. So I'll leave it to you to discuss it and uh, make your selections, please. I'm going to go with Song Zero, um, Samandi. There you go. <laughs> is that not for selection? Sorry. No, I'm sorry. We can't. We can't select Samandi, um, uh, but we have to select one of the other three. It's a fix. It's a fix. Pal. <laughs> of course. John, as I guess, would you like to take the jump into the void? Well, I'm going to go out on a limb, quite frankly, because all of them have got their faults hmm. in various opinions of different this and different that and so on. I don't really know ultimately what we are judging them on. Uh, Whatever you uh, feel like. Hit potential, uh, mood music. I don't know. This. What, what are we trying to evaluate? Overall <clears throat> each track, presentation. It, well, each track has got its pluses and its minuses, but I'm going to go out on a limb and for me and say track number one. I know because it's background music. It's, I'm a glutton for mood music. I love new music. I've got two orchestras that I've made a lot, a lot of albums with very successfully. Um, in spite of it not having uh, the melodic content, if you like, or the vocal content, it's, to me, got the most uh, listable content from, a, from a, a sound point of view. Instead of trying to pull it apart from mixing and voices and uh, all these different things that come in and out of the other tracks that uh, are confusing and don't gel together, 
um, I find that is the best of of the three from, cool. from my point of view. I'm going to okay. disagree with you. Hmm? <laughs> I'm going to disagree with you personally. Well, you can disagree with me, of course. Is you that can. right? I knew you were going to. That's right. I'm yeah, personally going to slap them. Go on. <laughs> Go on, be your worst, tell me. I'm going to go for number two. I thought you would. Because I think from the point of view of, yes, it needs a remix. No doubt about it, it needs a remix. But I think it's contemporary. I think, you know, it's the sort of thing people are conditioned to listening to these days and will probably sell a few units. Production is good. Vocalist is good. Drummer was fantastic. Sounds decent Um, to me. It's dated in a contemporary way. If you listen to a band called yeah. The Killers, it, it fits, trust me, on this. Hmm. You know, half your age, remember. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to let that one go, John. <laughs> I only invite him around that make me feel young again. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, number two for me, I think that's uh, probably, a, with a remix, it's contemporary and would, would work. All right. And, Tommy, what do you think? Well, unfortunately, I'm going to have to disagree with John. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I can see his points and, and, and concede them. Um, the genre that it fits in, it, it's, it's done very well. Uh, and I have to say, aside from mixing um, problems with all of them, um, the productions were equally strong points, soft points. Um, and surprisingly, I am going to admit to something normally I never would. Uh-oh. Ian's voice, Ian's vote, if I can speak correctly, has swayed me. I was going to go safe with number three, but in my heart, I, I really liked the mix and, and style. Not the mix as a uh, production mix, but the, the mix of... Uh, electronica and uh, ambient and rock and and it was very rhythmic track number two so i'll have to go with ian on this as much as my left leg is withering and dying <laughs> <laughs> it's song number two for me all right well there you have it a not a unanimous decision but a decision nonetheless track number two by spoons and chopsticks called happy song is your song of the week. Uh, Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, John, for being here especially and uh, Um, for sharing a little Samandi surprise with us. We appreciate that. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm really thrilled that you've... uh... You've played it and you're saying what you have about it. It's uh, That helps a lot and it's uh, really great to have uh, produced something that other people will uh, hopefully get uh, ultimate pleasure from. And obviously we'll do a review of the full album when it's out and oh, we'll get all that from the website. Yeah, great. And, you know, let us know when, when it's released. Uh, there'll be a lot, a lot and plug happening and plug. with it in the next uh, couple of months or so, yeah. Excellent. But obviously with having you on the show like... and Mr. Kelly as well, it's always nice to sort of help you along. It's good. Fantastic. And um, thanks again, very... both of you. Fantastic being on the show. Yeah, we absolutely oh, love having right. you with us. Yeah. And uh, says witness won't let him vote. All right. Well, try refreshing that screen, Trilo, and I will take a look at it as well, and we'll see if we can get that worked out for you. Until next time, everybody, we're going to play out with uh, Spoons and Chopsticks and their happy song. Thanks for being with us, everybody. Look forward to what you have to say on the witness statement as well. Ian, you want to fill everybody in on who's joining us next week? I already know. know. I don't know. I think you booked it, so I, I, I don't know. I'm up on I, this one. I did. It's Mr. Mark Lamdansky from Worldwide Indie Radio going to be with us next week, and we're looking forward to having him on the broadcast. Certainly hope you'll be with us, everyone. Talk to you soon. Until then, enjoy Spoons and Chopsticks right here on Music Scene Investigation. Say bye, bye. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.
Now 